Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of White House Chronicle, which is coming right up. But first, a few thoughts of my own. I have been a member of the American Association of Retired Persons for quite a long time. I even buy my health insurance through them, my supplementary insurance. But I have a beef with them. There's something wrong in their publications. They make old people feel terrible. They've got advertisements about things for your elbows, about automatic uh, bathtubs that don't leak, that you can open a door and get into, uh, funeral pots, and many articles implying that you won't have enough money to get by. Come on, people, come on. Not everybody who is old is miserable or wants to be miserable. The voice of their publications, particularly their bulletin, is so down. Cheer it up a bit. If you don't know this, there's a magazine that's published in England called The Oldster, which makes you feel good about being old. It looks down suitably at young people, uh, talks about the wonderful times that have been, uh, plays to reminiscence, and when you finish reading it, you feel this isn't so bad. So ARP, lighten up. We don't want to be put in the ground prematurely. Today I am so excited that you are here because I have with me one of the most gifted authors I have had the pleasure of meeting. His name is G. Wayne Miller, and he is the author of this absolutely extraordinary uh, uh, book, which is called Car Crazy. It is a history of the early days of the automobile industry in the US, how it got going, how it all came about. Wayne, welcome to the broadcast. You Thank are you a man well. who has written many books, one of them about NASCAR, yes. which led you into this one. And I have been reading it and I'm fascinated. Uh, how the car came about, how the government had no way of dealing with this evolution that turned into a revolution, it went so quickly and how people who hated cars were just swept aside by the public's demand for them. But it wasn't easy, was it? They were, they were pretty rough machines. Yes, I mean, they, rough is, I think, probably a kindly term used to describe them. Steam cars that blew up. Steam cars that blew up, gasoline cars that blew up and wouldn't start in the winter, wouldn't start in the summer and broke down. Uh, you know, the early gas, actually all of the early vehicles, steam, gas, and electric, um, often had mechanics, the, the wealthier people who, who drove them would have mechanics ride with them because they broke down so frequently. Uh, so it, it's been a long road to today's Camrys and, and beautiful cars. Gasoline was the game changer though, wasn't it? Gasoline was indeed the game changer. You know, the early but routes... The, but the early gasoline wasn't any more reliable than the cars, was it? No, and it was, it was in short supply and you couldn't get it everywhere, which at least initially hindered the, the spread of the, of the automobile through into certainly the rural areas. You know, the, the roots of the car industry really lie in Europe, uh, particularly in France and particularly in Germany. Uh, in the, the mid part of the 19th century. Uh, there were some steam vehicles even earlier, some in England, uh, one in Belgium, and also in, uh, in, in France and Germany. But your book is about the American experience. My book is about the American car industry. And, you know, as, as the European industry uh, was, was sort of taking root, there were a lot of people in this country who were tinkering on their own. And, by tinkering, what I mean is they would take a carriage, a horse-drawn carriage, and put a very rudimentary engine into it and try to mate the two so that you would have something We've that would We've got some run. pictures which were taken recently, yes. which were taken when you launched this book at, yes. at the Pell Center uh, in Rhode Island. And uh, uh, the first one we have here is a Durea 1893. Tell mm -hmm. us about that car, which we can see on the screen. That was the first car produced and sold commercially, specifically with an intent to make profit in the United States. And as you said, it dates to 1893 when two brothers, they were bicycle makers and mechanics uh, from Springfield, Mass, built a horseless carriage. Uh, and it, it was very interesting. When they launched it, the first ride they took, they invited a reporter along. You know, even in the very early days of the car industry, they realized that Publicity oh, and your marketing. book points out the marketing, the shenanigans, oh, yes. the races, the demonstrations, uh, and the uh, lousy things they said about each other's vehicles. 
Our second picture, which uh, is really the key to your book, is a 1904 Oldsmobile. Uh, Curve dash or dash curve? Curve dash Oldsmobile. Now that is the little turn up in the front that gave it the curve, which came from a cart or from a from a, it, a phaeton or something it, like it that. It actually came from a horse-drawn sleigh. The front it of the sleigh like, had yeah, it a, and looks, if you look at it, you, yeah, you so can you in can your mind's it. eye. Yeah. And and this was the this was the how what shall we say? This was the VW Beetle of its day. It was the Absolutely. The, 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 the Ford before Ford took the, it, took the lead. In 1904, the year that uh, that vehicle was made that, that you've shown in that picture, uh, in 1904, that model car was the best-selling car in America by far, and it only sold 4,000 models. Now tell us about it. Uh, I looked at, at the one that you had on display. It's, uh, it's obviously restored. It's in beautiful condition, uh, but it has a single cylinder engine about Correct. what seven horsepower six horsepower. oh seven horsepower what your lawn your honda lawnmower today would would put out your gas powered lawnmower and a tiller instead of a steering they wheel. didn't have steering wheels in in many vehicles at that time uh, Money, steering wheels were known though because ships had wheels correct but they hadn't yet adopted that technology to most cars so it was a tiller. It, it was like a tiller. I, would... I looked at the actual steering, uh, the, and not so different from what we had years later, the basic uh, 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 steering mechanism. The basic mechanism connected to the wheels was, yep. in fact, very similar to what came later, and, in fact, is pretty much in cars today. But the operator part of it was not a wheel. It was a tiller. Um, and where was the accelerator? The accelerator would, would be on the right-hand side. It was on the floor. Uh, as we said, it had a seven-horsepower engine. You had to hand crank it, as we saw yesterday when we ran one of these, when they ran one of these. But it was, they, they did, uh, they did uh, race these across country, didn't they? They did. Uh, and that's one of the sub-narratives of this book and actually how I became interested in writing this book. In 1905, that model vehicle raced another Oldsmobile. It was part race, part publicity and marketing stunt from Manhattan to Portland, Oregon. Now, to think that a vehicle like that, or any vehicle, any gas-powered vehicle, could even travel that distance was pretty extraordinary because a lot of that trip, particularly once you get west of the Mississippi, there were no roads. They followed railroad tracks, and they went on old stagecoach trails, and it took them the and winter of, of that race. of course, the conditions were terrible. Ruts terrible. And horses had dug up the ground. Exactly. Um, it, brought up stones. Anybody knows anything about horses knows they tend to bring up stones that are... Uh, close to the surface. Yeah, and you know, they left in the spring, and so spring rains turned all the roads to mud, which was a real nightmare for this car or for any, any form of transportation. Washed bridges out. They got swept away in a couple of floods. I mean, it was, it was quite an adventure. Uh, and I, that was actually one of my more enjoyable parts of, of research. It was chronicling that race in 1905. Henry Ford, yeah. legendary name. He, he was a little bit of a slower starter, wasn't he? He had two or three companies that failed. He was. He was. Uh, he had two companies that failed until June of 1903 when he formed what we now know as the, the Ford Motor Company. That was his third automobile. He was a farm boy from outside of Detroit, but he was born with a natural talent for mechanics, for tools, for clocks and watches. He taught himself as a young boy how to fix clocks and watches. Also, he, he, he went for the mass market before there was a mass market. He saw that possibility when other people wanted to sell value-added expensive cars, which that, is basically that, still true today because there's a larger correct. markup in expensive cars. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of manufacturers, including Olds at that time, which made that, that curve dash. The, the new person who took over there in a, one of the great corporate coups of America, he deposed the founder, ran some Olds. He wanted to build those high-priced cars, but Henry Ford knew right from the start that the success was going to be cheap, reliable, mass-market cars. And uh, the Dash sold for $650. Correct. Uh, Ford envisioned a $400 car. Did that come to pass? No, it did not come to pass at $400. He sold the model at $500. He was pretty close to that price point. And then the T came out, and it wasn't that much more in 1908. This is the famous Model T, which was the first mass-produced car, really. Uh, 
technically you would call it the first mass-produced car. I mean, Oldsmobile had been producing in quote-unquote mass numbers, but in, in truly yeah, revolutionary We have on the screen a uh, uh, Ford Model T Speedster, which is not terribly representative. I mean, it's the same car, except it has a sporty body, the one we photographed, Correct. Uh, rather than a more conventional saloon or sedan body, whatever term you... Yeah, that, you know, that again, Americans have, and people of many nations have loved speed right from the very beginning. And so if you wanted a T with its reliability and its good power and engine and all that, you could get this model and race it around the way the race car drivers did on tracks. My father learned to drive in a Model T, and he oh, wow. had great things to say about it. Um, he thought it was really a remarkable piece of engineering. What made the Model T every man's car. The assembly line certainly uh, helped in that regard. Henry Ford's fanatic commitment to quality. And he realized that if you produced a vehicle and mass produced parts for that vehicle in great quantity and used those same parts for all of your different models, for your T, for the T version of in, in, in a truck, for example, that you could get greater reliability. Uh, and so it was really the, the quality of the engineering, it was the quality of the motor. I mean, that's not to say it was like a perfectly running machine, because bear in mind this was 1908. But it, it still had a variable differential, didn't it? Yes, it did. And Which is very important, because it means they could go around corners more easily. Correct. And, and he had a steering wheel, of course, in the team. And team. a wheel. I, I remember looking at them. They actually had the accelerator between the other two pedals. Yes. Which was continued into the A. Uh, originally. And you, you were talking to me earlier about the Model A. Your father had a Model A. That's there? right. Um, but anyway, the, the T changed the world. It, it did change the world. It did. It also made governments realize they had to build roads. Ours, yes. ours seems to have forgotten that. But um. And, you know, prior to the introduction of the T, which again was in, in uh, October of 1908 when the Model T hit the market finally and, and literally took off like a rocket, Prior to that, dating back, you know, more than 10 years prior to that, there were a lot of car enthusiasts, motorists, who wanted good roads. And they formed this interesting alliance with bicycle riders who also wanted good roads. And so the two forces joined, and there were battles both at the local and the federal level to get good roads. Uh, the federal government was rather slow, actually, in, in getting on board that train, as it were. Um, the counties and some of the cities and some of the states did some of the earlier work in improving roads and making roads that didn't flood out, for example, didn't turn to mud, uh, that had you know ways to direct you and, and so forth. Good I'm, roads. I'm going to take a little break for station yes. identification, uh, primarily for our listeners on Sirius XM Radio. You are listening to White House Chronicle. I, my guest, I am the Welland King, of course, and my guest is G. Wayne Miller the author of this extraordinary, very readable book, Car Crazy. Uh, I haven't finished reading it, but I'm very close to it, and it's a wonderful book. If you're interested in cars, you'll love it. This program can be seen on 200 American television stations and around the world on the English language stations of Voice of America, also on Voice of America radio broadcasts. You can hear it there. When, uh, what got you into cars in that stage? I have liked cars since my very first car when I was a teenager. Um, 16 and a half years old when I got my license. My mother had a 1953 Ford sedan, which I called my car. Technically, it was still her car, but she let me drive it. Uh, you know, and the freedom, and you know, as a teenager, you do all the usual stuff. You do the donuts, and you speed, and you whatever. And I love that car. It was a three-speed. You probably have heard, I'm sure you've heard the term, three on the tree. It was a standard transmission. First, second, third, and reverse would be up and back. Um, so that was really my early the, 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 love the, of cars. The, the, much later, the, 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 uh, uh, quite a few cars were, were, were three forwards. The first Mustang, uh, I had the use of one, and... Uh, provided by a newspaper, a bit of a complicated story. But it was three forwards, which always was surprising. You'd have thought it had four, but it was three. It was a beautiful little car. I mean, that was the real Mustang. Then it kind of got elephantitis and grew. And well, it came out in 1964. It was Lee Iacocca's 
baby. It was Lee it was Iacocca's brilliant, baby. Brilliant, brilliant design for an automobile. I, I didn't get my hands one to, on one until 1966. And um, you did get one. I did get one, but I remember working on a newspaper in London where somebody had broken the story, broken an embargo, I suspect, and they put on the front page this amazing new car that was coming in America, the Mustang. It was considered sufficiently good that an English newspaper with a circulation in the mil millions would put the Mustang as the off lead, the second most important article on page one, as your newspaper man knows perfectly well. Uh, Tell me about the court case. There was a court case where somebody, uh, it was called the Sledden case, I believe. Selden. Selden case. The Selden patent case, yeah. Yeah, wanted to say that every gasoline automobile built violated his pay, uh, patent unless you paid him a fee. And this was incredible. This put some companies out of business, frightened others into paying the fee or going out of business. He was a man by the name of George Selden from Rochester, New York. He was the son of a, of a judge, a well-known judge. He was himself a lawyer and he, he was an inventor. I mean, he had a few patents and in, in about 18, the late 1870s, early 1880s, he began tinkering with a machine that he called an automobile and he played a patent game. And so over the he submitted his patent application, but he withheld it for final approval until late in the century when other people were already making cars. And then he got approval for it, and he claimed that he, and he alone of all people on the planet, not just in America, was the father of the gasoline automobile. One of the marvelous things to read in this is the deposition of Henry Ford, who yes. had an extraordinary memory. He did. And who just went back to how he had you know, and said very simply but very effectively that this man had contributed nothing to automobile science and that basically it was a fraud. And, and yet he tied the automobile industry up for how many years? Over 10 years he had tied the automobile industry up. And, and one of the few people and the, and the true champion who fought that, I mean, what, what the people who held that patent won was essentially a monopoly. And they intimidated people through many lawsuits, through advertising. They hired spies to go through the streets and see which vehicles had, the, you know, the patent symbol on their car. Henry Ford committed, uh, to much to the chagrin of some of his stockholders, all of his resources to fighting this thing. And the battle went on for years and years and years. And he finally was victorious. You mentioned the deposition. That was one of the great delights in, in doing this book. When I went to the Henry Ford Museum and Archives in, in Dearborn, Michigan, um, I got to see that original testimony. I had never seen it before. And it was, as you said, he had this incredibly prodigious and photographic memory. And, and you could just get this image of Ford on the stand reciting details and, and refuting this ridiculous claim that one person, any one person, let alone this one person, invented the gasoline automobile. Vroom, vroom. We're in 1912. <laughs> um, Toad of Toad Hall is probably being written somewhere, but never mind Toad of Toad Hall. Uh, let's, uh, we, we're here, we've got the Model T. Uh, what happens now? This is, the, this is the runaway bestseller. This puts everybody somewhat in the dust. What happens? How did Oldsmobile and the others uh, uh, counter this? Well, Oldsmobile collapsed because they had bet the farm on the high-priced luxury model. And there were already Daimlers and Benzes and fancy imports and other American cars that had that market. So Oldsmobile and, and literally hundreds, there were hundreds of automobile manufacturers in the period I mainly chronicled, 1893 to 1908. Many of them totally went out of business. Uh, there were a few aggressive competitors. Walter Chrysler, certainly, the Dodge Brothers, certainly, and, and a few other cars, Packard for a while. Uh, but uh, Ford really just flattened the, the, the playing field, and he was a force to be reckoned with. And you either adopted his techniques of manufacturing and, and competed on that level, or, or you were gone. Uh, among the cars that we have uh, photographs of, suddenly in 1912, you have the, um, uh, not, I beg your pardon, 1908, the Packard. This is no longer a primitive thing. This is a real car with doors and a roof and uh, uh, a squeeze uh, uh, thing for a, a horn. 
uh, this is looks like a car. We can recognize it as a car, yes. not as a museum piece. That is very fast from 1904 to 1908. In four years, there was a great move forward. Well, again, there were so many people who were inventing, so many people who were joining the competition. They were learning from each other. They probably, you know, they probably were stealing ideas from each other. Uh, you know, the Packard, the Packard Company was founded by somebody who had worked for Olds before. So he had that mechanical knowledge and understanding. He was able to build uh, a quite superior car. But that was a, a higher end car, the Packard. I mean, for many years it was, you know, that was one of the luxury cars in America. Ford really just, he just owned the mass market for many, many years. When did the self-starter come in? The self-starter, you mean the electric starter? The electric starter. That, that came, I don't know exactly what year that came in. That was after the period I wrote about. I'm guessing it was in the 1910s. Uh, I don't know for certain. Throughout my early life, all cars had a crank, but you didn't have to use it unless it was an emergency, was unless backup. you had a problem with yeah. a flat battery or something. Uh, but you could crank them, and you saw people routinely cranking cars, and you know, thought nothing of it. I've cranked lots of cars. Sometimes you pull your shoulder a bit, but <laughs> it comes back on you. If you get too much compression, it'll do that to you. Uh, and then Ford is forging ahead, so suddenly the story, the narrative is Ford. And along comes, after the T, the A. This was a fairly sophisticated car by comparison. I mentioned my father had one after the Second World War and ran it for 10 years as a viable automobile. In today's world, it would be rather bizarre because it had the fuel tank right in the cowling, right on top of you. Uh, with a you know very accurate fuel gauge because it was a float. You could see the gasoline there. Doesn't but sound in, very safe. <laughs> in an accident, you wouldn't be a very happy camper. No, uh, you would not. And uh, it seemed to me the next big advance really was hydraulic brakes, which really had nothing to do with these engines or with what you were writing about. Yeah, but and, it, and power steering and a lot of other power. Oh, well, those, those were all luxuries added uh, and now indispensable. People have no idea what it was like to turn a heavy car without uh, No, or even roll a window down. You oh, know, yeah, yeah. The, these yeah. early cars didn't even have windows. So we, the, that first Ford I had had rolled the crank windows, and it, it was... Uh, I've had lots of cars with crank windows. That's not a great hardship. Well, we're spoiled. I can't imagine having one now. Today's cars yeah. are surprisingly good, aren't they? They are. You don't get flats very often. They go for, used to be at 70,000 miles, you consider the car, get rid of it before something fails. Now it's 150 to 200,000 miles. So there's been a huge uh, improvement. There has, there has. And you know, a lot of credit to, has to go to Toyota and, and uh, what is now known as Nissan Datsun in the early days, the, the Japanese manufacturers who beginning in the, the 60s and particularly in the 70s and 80s when Detroit was turning out a very inferior product, they were looking simply for for profit, and, and they knew that they, you know, the term planned obsolescence was really a, was almost their downfall. At that time, during that period, Toyota and, and uh, Datsun realized that what people really wanted was a car that lasted, and so they invested in techniques and manufacturing and design that gave you a reliable car. And you know, today you can drive a Toyota, and, and Detroit finally did catch up, or you can drive a Toyota or a Ford or any of today's you know quality automobiles, 200,000 miles pretty much easily without much going wrong. I asked a young man I know, he's not so young anymore, but when he was fairly young, uh, what he thought the best cars were. And he said, well, they're all getting so good, it's hard to say. They are. And when I uh, checked with him 20 years later, he said, they really have reached a standard of, it's really a personal choice now. You're going to get many of the same things of quality, of longevity, et cetera. No, that's absolutely true. You know, of course, the next thing will be the self-driving car. Google has invested significantly in that, and other companies you have know, as well. I, I find that hard, <laughs> hard to get excited about. But uh, uh, I, I find very exciting the return of the electric car. The electric car was doomed 
doom by batteries that had no longevity. It was. That was the end of, of electric cars really as a going concern in, in the period I write about. They just totally dropped out of the out of the game because the batteries didn't last They're long. They're lead-acid batteries, and, and they weren't even as good as today's lead-acid no, batteries. No, no, there were no charging stations once you get outside of a city, and so... Uh, but yeah, that's a great development, certainly in terms of you know global warming and. I, and I have the been very interested in, in. I've talked about this and written about it. Uh, induction charging. Uh, South Korea is doing it with buses, where you drive the vehicle, and they do it in the bus stop. It stops, and rather like the way you charge an, uh, a phone or something, there's no wire. I mean, it's just an electro. Huh. It's a magnetic field. Yeah. Uh, charges and on it goes so the vehicle is much lighter because you don't need such a big battery and of course you get rid of the <laughs> the wire out of the kitchen window it's going to be a while before we see them in cars but that i think is a lot more interesting as a development than than automatic drive because it's going to take so much collateral development to make it possible for safety for for other drivers, it may come. I mean, I, I never, I, never in these things say it won't happen because it exactly. does happen. Exactly. Uh, of these cars, have you had old cars? Have you? Are you like Jay Leno in love with everything with three or four wheels or even two wheels? No. I'm, well, first of all, I, I don't have the uh, the resources Jay Leno has to collect three or four hundred cars. If I did, I would probably, I'm, I'm certainly would, would collect cars. I I, I drive a, a Toyota now. I like my Toyota. Uh, in my youth, I, I tried to rebuild some old cars, a 1950s Studebaker, a couple of other cars. But then I went to college and became a writer, and that became my my true passion. But I still love and appreciate cars. And in the year I had spent following the NASCAR circuit. That early love just came back really, really big time. And I got to drive a Jack Roush Stage 4 Mustang doing an ungodly speed. It could go 0 to 60, I want to say about 3.8 seconds without exaggeration. That was power. I would take one of those today. Well, apparently you can get that out of electric vehicles or very really? close can to you? it. Because you've got, you have no gears. You simply full power. The Navy is trying to build electrically powered ships to get the advantages they once had with steam, wow. which was full power ahead, full power astern, etc. The new littoral ship is apparently going to be an electric ship. It will probably have generation on board. It won't, won't have to go into port and stick it in a plug, you know. <laughs> um, what other books have you written? Well, I, I wrote one of my favorite books was called King of Hearts which was about the person who invented open heart surgery, C. Walton Lillehigh, MD. Nobody uh, really until the book knew much about him. Um, I wrote Toy Wars, which was I spent three more than three years embedded in Hasbro Toy Company and saw the toy industry from the inside out with battles with Mattel. And, and I've written some, uh, some short stories and horror and mystery. and Wonderful. We have to leave it there. All right. Get well. this book. It is very, very readable, fascinating. Uh, Car Crazy by G. Wayne Miller. G. Wayne Thank Miller, you. thank you for Thank coming you on so the broadcast. Much. I appreciate it.